So in today's video, we're going to be talking about, probably in my opinion, at least one of the most fun ways to play against 1e4, which is going to be the modern defense with g6. And just a disclaimer, this probably shouldn't be the first opening that you learn seriously against 1e4, because by incurring the space disadvantages we do in many hypermodern openings by not trying to control the center of our pawns very early on, we naturally have to be a bit more careful than let's say more classical openings like e4, e5. However, once you do understand the modern opening, you understand a lot of the nuances of it, it can be an incredibly fun opening to play. So in this video, I'm gonna be teaching you guys 20 ideas that every modern player must know. But with that being said, let's get right into things now for the first section. So as with any opening in chess, before you start getting into any of the weeds and complicated aspects of it, you wanna try and establish a good fundamental basis first before like you get into the more advanced stuff. So I wanna explain one of the key ideas that we're going to be looking at in the modern basically for the rest of the video. And that is going to be after the following moves where we play the move A6. And this is not the only way to play the modern defense, but in my opinion, it is probably the best one. And this move is somewhat reminiscent of the Sicilian Night Off, which occurs after E4, the Sicilian and the following moves on the board, right? And of course, this is one of the most respectable openings in chess in general. And okay, this move prevents like any pieces from coming to b5. It also prepares b5 in many variations. But what about this position? Because it really does feel like, okay, like in the Sicilian, maybe you understand it, but here, like we don't have much space in the center. We're neglecting our development. Surely this can't really be that good, right? And I remember when I was much younger and I was learning this opening for the first time, or well, I came across the opening for the first time, I thought the exact same thing. And while this opening might not objectively be up there with like E4, E5, it's definitely a lot better than it looks at first sight. And the fundamental point of this move really is, well, it's preparing B5, much like in the Sicilian Nidorf. And we're going to try and put our bishop on b7, our knight on d7, and then eventually prepare the c5 counter break in the center, where we're going to try and establish counterplay in that fashion. And it's important to note that we're often doing this at the expense of actually our king's side development. Many people might think like, okay, that's great and all that you're going a6, but like, why can we not just develop our king's side pieces? What's wrong with this? And Technically, there's not anything wrong with this. This transposes to the Pirates opening, which actually very often happens after e4, d6, knight of 6, knight c3, g6, and here white has an array of moves, f4, for example, bishop e3, knight of 3, or let's say knight of 3, bishop g7, and this goes back to the position that we were just uh, looking at after the following moves, and I just showed a6, but again, knight of 6 would transfer back to the Pirates opening. However, while there is technically nothing objectively wrong with the Pirates opening, you're going to have the option of not developing your knight so early, I recommend that we use that extra flexibility to play a6 very early on. When we see this move knight c3, I'll explain that a little bit later what I mean, and actually develop our queen side pieces of b5, bishop b7, knight d7, c5, and then only then, later on, at least usually, going for knight of six castles. To understand though, actually in a concrete sense, the benefit of delaying knight of six, I wanna show you guys one of the most annoying variations, at least in my opinion, versus the Pirates defense, which is called the 150 attack by many people, which is going for bishop e3, bishop g7, queen d2, and essentially going for this line where you long castle, you put your pawn f3, go h4, bishop h6, g4, and you just hack your way down the king side. It is very, very difficult to defend against this sort of attack as black. It happens something very similar, often the Sicilian dragon actually in what we'd call kind of a Yugoslav attack, where we have the following moves, castles, queen d2, knight c6, long castles, or uh, bishop c4 actually is another move, and very often you try to castle long and start like storming like the king side and it's very scary as black to defend against this sort of thing. But again, in the modern, because we have not yet, uh, at least in this position, can be our knight to f6, we can instead again go a6, b5, long castles, bishop b7, and let's say we have similar setup to what we saw earlier, except the key difference is for the knight on g8, right, it's a lot more difficult for white to play bishop h6, and we're going to cover this in more detail later, but for now, I just want you guys to understand, among a few other things, this is one of the big benefits of playing the modern move order, where we again delay the development of the knight on g8. So following on from the discussion we were just having, where, you know, we saw the a6 move and us going like, let's say, b5, let's say white just evolves the bishops in the center very sort of naturally like this, and castles short, knight e7, queen d2. 
now connecting their rooks in the center. Very natural stuff so far. You might sort of be thinking from here, well, now what do we do, right? Because we have the pieces on the squares we said we were going to develop them on. We played like the b5 break and stuff. But what do we do now? Do we play like knight of six? And you might have to be a little bit careful of playing such a move because you do have to somewhat watch out for the e5 break, for example, after takes takes. Knight g4, it might look like this opponent's sort of falling, but you also have to be careful about white just playing e6 forced in true uh, this pawn and after takes, for example, knight g5. This is an idea we are going to see a bit throughout the video. When, of course, if a white knight lands on the e6 square, that could be uh, incredibly dangerous. So, coming back to the position then after queen d2, what do we do instead of playing knight g to f6? And this is very important. This is going to be a pawn break, which almost every game you get in this sort of tiger modern sub. By the way, the tiger modern is sort of noting the sub that we get with a6, then going for b5, bishop b7, knight c7 etc. Not named after the animal tiger, but a Swedish grandmaster. Actually, he's written several books in the opening, but okay. Queen d2 and c5. This is the pawn break you guys want to remember. You might also be thinking of e5, but I'm not a big fan of it because it sort of shuts in. Bishop and after this exchange doesn't really have a lot of potential. Also after d5, both these bishops potentially have kind of been shut in, uh, but this might not be as bad because we might have with the close center, counterplay of f5 eventually. But yes, c5 is what you want to do, and this is a very important move. A lot of players might just like spaz out and take on c5, and usually we want to take back the, the piece if possible, gain the knight sort of active. And at the lower levels, the very common mistake people make is they'll just like snap off the knight, thinking like, oh, scary piece. But the reality is, is that bishop is a very important piece, and the moment we get the bishop here like this, it's uh, not very good news for, for white. For example, if they play rook ad1, we can play c4, they move the bishop, we exchange, and they probably have to play the passive retreating move knight takes d2, because after rook takes d2, which unfortunately in the lead chess database is uh, shockingly common, after bishop takes e3 takes, and uh, not even knight, uh, sorry, not even bishop takes e4 rather, we can actually play knight of six, and basically just flex on white that after uh, the knight pops on e4, even if they move it, we're still winning material, and this is absolutely devastating. That being said, d takes e5 in of itself is not such a bad move, but white just needs to like not like take on c5, right? They probably instead need to maybe try find something else to do, maybe like a rook to e1, a rook to d1, something like that. But still, I think black is completely fine in such a position. Also looking at some other responses after c5, a very common idea for white is to maybe push their pawn to d5, when we sort of find ourselves in what we'd call a Benoni structure, where the Benoni is of course like the opening we'd get after, let's say d4, of course different first move completely, but c5, d5, that's not to say of course we can't play the modern after this as well, we can, but okay, a bit off topic, d5, d6, and let's say knight c3, knight c6, e4, and whenever black plays a6 and Benoni, it's important to understand that white is usually going to want to prevent black from like playing b5 as they want to, play a4, just a very, very standard response. But after d5, you can see that now we're transposing into a Benoni structure, but of course it's not physically possible to prevent black from playing b5 because we already did that like 10 years ago, right? So at this point, like we can start developing our kingside pieces and castle and like we're pretty happy over here. I wouldn't really suggest, I mean, you could maybe start pushing these guys, but I think it's best to just keep our options open at this point and be flexible, don't really rush and try and do anything too crazy right now. For example, b4, I think knight a4 for example, and now for this pawn here, we've sort of loosened our grip over the c4 uh, square, among other things, and now with the pawn on b4, white can maybe chip away at it with, with this move a3, and I think that we're allowing some counterplay, which I don't really like, so I would instead just suggest playing something like knight f6, we can maybe either pawn a little bit, for example, c4, b4, could potentially be a threat. And let's say bishop h6, uh, this is a move which a lot of people are going to play because they think that like, okay, they, they would be right in saying that we cannot avoid the exchange of dark squared bishops, but that does not mean the position is ultimately not fine for us because as I have outlined in the position right now, we can, for example, play next rook e8, e6, chip away at the d5 pawn, also c4, knight c5 is another very common idea, kicking the bishop away and improving our knight. And really the trade of darks with bishops just doesn't really matter that much with 
the fact that they're castle kingside, they can't easily shove their age pawn at our throat and kind of hack us down the age file. And given the darks where bishops have just been exchanged off, we can maybe use that to our advantage. Concretely speaking, we could consider, for example, this maneuver of a knight to g4 to e5. But again, I think this other plan of just simply going to e6 and shipping away d5 pawn is plenty good. But also after c5, we've talked about what happens if white pushes, what happens if they snap the pawn off. It's also very common though that they might just leave the tension completely and just play a move like rook f1 for example, but don't worry, this is completely fine, we can just take. After either recapture, knight f6, we're fine. Knight takes d4, we're also fine. Let's say they play f3, castles, again, bishop h6 is not something we're massively worried about, and in fact, in this position, is not even a good idea because of queen b6. If they take, that gets hung with check. If they like walk it like this, e5 is very concerning for them, so maybe they're retreat back and hope that they're somehow okay but unfortunately with knight g4 this is in fact quite uh bad now an okay technically material is still equal but their pawn structure is not looking too too hot and for that reason black is already a bit better and just to speak of these sorts of positions in general without the sort of tactical mistake bishop h6 being in the picture this is very much just like a, a good version of the Sicilian dragon because again as we just sort of looked at a few minutes ago right the most critical idea against Sicilian dragon in many of these openings where we have a pawn on g6 is when our opponent just starts like hacking us down the king side they've castled the queen side and they start like throwing everything on the king side right but in the Sicilian dragon if you just castle short and you you adapt like this very timid sort of setup you could say with like your pieces on sort of comfortable looking squares but ultimately not doing anything too brute force it usually just allows black to also adopt a very comfortable position where like okay from here you might sort of not really know how to play sicilian dragon positions that's fine because again this is a very good version of it we can like for example bring a rook to the c file it makes sense because it's like a semi-open c file a queen to c7 so further stacking pressure along there a rook to d8 maybe, a knight to e5 and then c4. Sometimes we can also consider taking this. Some circumstances b4 that push might also make some sense. And if our pieces are really, really well placed, we can then further consider, for example, e5 and then followed by d5, really uh, asserting our dominance on the chessboard as the alpha male. So this next point is going to be very important. And it's a very common mistake, which for example, in this position could be made and I believe in the Leech's database I'm just going to double check is the most common move yep 25,000 people have played it that's with up to even 2,500 but yeah it's about 20,000 if you take out the 22 and 2,500s which is this move A3 and I don't know why so many well I know why people play it but it's a very brain dead move which a lot of people make and basically the logic behind A3 is they want to stop you from playing B4 the problem is b4 is not actually a threat and so our opponent is basically wasting the whole tempo to prevent something which at least if you know how to play the open is black you are never going to play in the first place and it's not like you're winning after a3 is played you're, you're not but like as we just looked at in some of these positions right with like bishop d3 bishop b7 castles knight e7 and c5 right like we already established it in these positions we were pretty much fine but if you throw into the picture that why is this wasted an extra tempo of a3 that should pretty much in your head tell you that we're going to be more than fine after bishop b7 knight e7 c5 whatever and they're like playing the positions we know except they've just wasted like whole bloody tempo right so not really too much to unpack here but just be aware a lot of people play like this they, they've never studied the modern in their life they have no idea what they're doing but just to illustrate for you right like after bishop d3 why is b4 not a threat and well it's a you know they can go knight d5 maybe they can also probably play knight e2 i'd say maybe this is even a little bit better because for example if you do go knight d5 it might seem like you're attacking the pawn but Let's say c6 happens, you're not actually going to want to take that because then a5 and the knight is curiously trapped. So you'd want to come back to f4 and I don't know, I think it's just a lot simpler if you come back to e2, reroute it to g3, chip away at this pawn later which is overextended with a3 and just have a very healthy position. Which again highlights the fact which was that b4 was never a threat you need to prevent with this move a3. So this fourth idea is going to be a bit contradictory to what I've literally just been talking about which is Sometimes you have to not play a6 b5 and it's important to note that a6 b5 becomes a viable idea once the white knight pops up onto c3. Let's say for example our opponent plays bishop to e2. Let's say you try and continue through with a6 
castles b5. The whole problem is, is that b5 only really makes sense insofar as there's a knight here that you can attack with b4. Because now with no knight on b, sorry, on c3 rather, if white plays a4 and chips away at our pawn, we usually don't want to take it because then it improves their pawn structure. They have a weak pawn on a6 they can play. There's nothing really good that can come of this. Uh, playing c6, try and keep the tensions also very passive and quite frankly just loses the pawn tactically after this because of course if you take it then our rook hangs on a8 which then brings you the question why can't we play b4 and technically we can the only problem is we don't gain a tempo so it looks kind of stupid and after c3 chipping away at the pawn let's say we take knight takes c3 and to just be blunt this position is just not good like we are behind in development we're behind in our central control we don't even have any counterplay on the queen side anymore there's literally just nothing good to say about our position and some people might say this is a problem with the modern opening altogether it's bad man like don't play it but if you handle it well and you take away like the stuff that i am teaching you in this video you can get a lot of good positions with it but if you play an autopilot and treat it like some opening system you're going to go wrong because already from the very start of the game where you have a space disadvantage you're going to have to be a little bit more careful than you normally would and that means when you see a sale from white where they don't commit a knight to c3 very early on for example they play an early bishop e2 or maybe bishop d3 for example some more stuff applies there you're going to instead want to consider let's say after bishop e2 for example reverting back to more of a period serve by going knight to f6 forcing white to play knight c3 and let's say or a maniac and want to like spend another tempo with the bishop also though let's say they go bishop d3 here we're still gonna play knight f6 anyway okay they don't have to spend another tempo but it's no big deal in these positional lines where they're not really gonna attack us on the king side as much it's a lot more tolerable going back to some of these pirates positions not to mention the fact i mean it's just like what other options you have i mean like if we can't really wait on the queen side so to speak with a6 b5 whatever because they're just gonna slam us with a4 well, you kind of just have to go back to king side development, and that's exactly what we are going to do, and we're going to cover this more in depth in the third section. So, now that we understand the basic fundamentals of the modern opening, I think now it is a good moment to really move on to some more particular approaches that White can play, and we're going to start off by looking at the kind of more aggressive ones where they try to like rip your head off in 15 moves because ultimately as a modern player that's what's going to be most scary and to start off with we're going to be looking at this h4 idea and this can occur in a variety of positions including on move two here i want to primarily discuss right now what to do when your opponent plays it so early on like do you just freak out and like i don't know spaz out by going h5 as well well you could but I think you have something even better and on the other end of the spectrum though you could also just like completely ignore it and just continue living daily life as normal with bishop g7 but after h5 d6 for example d4 this is actually quite potentially risky now because the pawn is ready to advance to h6 i mean you don't really want to stop it like this that's very very ugly what you're doing to your king side structure here and if you do allow the pawn to h6 by the way they're not really going to take if this happens i think we should be pretty okay there's nothing like too scary going on there but if they push the pawn to h6 we're forced backwards and the pawn it's very far advanced some might call it a weakness i don't really think it is rather basically just stops us from castling very easily and inhibits our development overall and i think that white's just really better because of that and we're probably gonna have to do some awkward crap like moving our bishop over here which we never really wanted to do in the first place so when you see h4 so early on on like move two or maybe even move three like after d4 bishop g7 h4 let's start by looking at this one though i think it's very convenient let's say to immediately counterattack the pawn on uh, sorry not d6 d5 like this and if they just keep pushing i think we can just take if they take we can take like this knight of six bishop g7 castles and i think it's only safe to be honest so what i would probably expect after d5 is to see let's say like e takes d5 and then after queen takes d5 well what do we have here and basically the way i like to conceptualize this is we have basically a scandinavian which some people might like trash on but all things being said it's not like completely terrible opening it's playable and we have this version of it after h4 and g6 being inserted and h4 to be honest like it doesn't really contribute much to the development of white's position whereas g6 does for black and also if you think about it we're very much meeting a flank attack 
with an attack in the center, which is typically how you want to meet these sort of flank pawn moves very early on in the game. Hence why I think that this is a very principled approach to sort of countering a very early h4 that we might see as early as move two. Let's continue the line a little bit more though. Let's say knight c3, queen a5. They go h5. We can play knight c6 if they take. We take back the f pawn. And we're probably not going to castle kingside at this point. I think what is quite nice is for us to castle queenside instead. And uh, yeah, all in all, we have pretty good development. Maybe our pawn structure isn't the best. But yeah, it's definitely questionable the time that Wyatt has invested into playing this whole h4, h5 stuff. And whether it has really paid off or not, I would say probably not. From here, we can consider maybe knight of 6, bishop g7, e5. Maybe also just putting knight on e5 to place our pieces very actively but also let's say d4 bishop g7 and then h4 in this case i think also d5 works quite well for example if e takes d5 uh well they have to defend this first of all so knight f3 let's say but bishop g4 knight c6 we quickly we counter attack against d4 pawn e5 and like yeah again it's very difficult to really just hold this whole situation together so maybe they're going to crack and take but after this we can probably take but we can even just long castle and delay the capture no real rush to be honest and again pretty fine position and also if after d5 they try to close the center then we can counter attack it and this is very similar actually to a variation which can occur in the sicilian of e4 c5 the hyper accelerated dragon where some people they won't want to play an open sicilian they'll want to play c3 you don't need to know what all this is just know that this is like a pretty popular variation against the up that black can play and after takes takes e5 we have a very similar structure as we have in sort of this position after white plays c3 to try and hold the center together except they've again played a move h4 which to me seems kind of out of place we can play knight c6 immediately but we can also play h5 and it might seem like we've sort of wasted the tempo as well but i think that it probably benefits black a little bit more the insertion of these moves because now let's say after something like this they can never really play a tree to kick away our bishop which makes this pin very annoying with the pressure that we're going to be putting onto the pawn of queen b6 e6 97 knight of 5 and black is already more than equal however once we get past move 3 and white has not really played any h4 for example let's say knight c3 d6 h4 now if they do it and move 4 well, I think in this sort of situation, it's very difficult once you've like spent a tempo on d6, for example, and they have a knight controlling the d5 square for us to really spend more time pushing the pawn doesn't really make so much sense. And we really do need to address the threat of h5 because if they just start rolling the pawn down, it's not going to be much fun. So in this sort of situation, we have generally two options, either to, let's say, push h6 or to push h5. Both of them have their pros and cons. The benefit, of course, of going h5 immediately is that you don't have to think about them going h5 anymore the con is that you weaken g5 and all of the time right our opponent's just going to be able to capitalize on that very simply by placing the knight into the g5 square whereas if you played h6 uh that wouldn't be a possibility but when you play h6 you also have to consider like what if they just play h5 anyway you're not going to take it you're going to push g5 but then let's say they play f4 and they really just try to bust open the entire position this can be very confronting it can be very scary and while the computer might say it's not so bad that's only if you play a very uh, precise series of moves it's so like personally if i had this exact position i'd probably just play h5 myself just not having to consider any h5 pushes but that being said h4 in this exact position to move for is a little bit rare it's usually a bit more common later on let's say for example they go for this king side attacking approach which very often is called the 150 attack i have no idea why but it's just called that let's say a6 queen d2 b5 long castles and eventually let's say h4 so again in this position we have a decision to make how do we address this whole like h5 thing we don't just want to allow them to play it for free so probably we're going to mainly be considering again between two fins either playing h5 or h6 and here it's worth noting that now if we go uh h6 because they've already spent a tempo on f3 like we're not really as concerned especially they've not only spent a tempo of f3 but they've also spent a tempo playing bishop e3 so if they do play this here like after takes takes e5 we might be getting quick counter play in and it probably wouldn't be that scary so definitely h6 is something to seriously consider but for the sake of simplicity across like many different variations move order subtleties white could employ like for example uh playing g4 first instead of h4 like playing a wade move like king b1 i personally think it is the simplest just to play h5 just have that peace of mind like 
instead of thinking like, okay, I'm going to go h6 in this situation, I'm going to go h5 in that one, you can if you're a very strong player and you think these minute details are going to make uh, a big difference, but I think for most players, you should just try and learn one plan and stick to it most of the time. And personally, I think h5 is just a little bit simpler. So it's worth noting, by the way, if like White tries to play g4 and like starts like really banging the head against our king side, this isn't really going to work so well because we can play h6, g4 takes, b4, and uh, now off the knight d5, e6, very precise attacking the knight here if they take this. I don't think we need to take this because after bishop g2, actually, like White's pieces are getting decently active but rather what I do like is knight gf6 and we're not only attacking this one but we're attacking this pawn as well. The engine gives some precise line there's some reasons behind why like if you want to go c5 and stuff I don't really recommend like memorizing all of this but one of them is that uh, by playing c5 now that when they go bishop g5 we take this pawn not even this one we can put our queen on b6 because it got opened up with c5 and now we're running c4 and like attacking b2, very precise engine moves, right? The basic point is, is that when they play g4, right, this sort of is a very fragile pawn structure they have for these pawns on e4 and g4, not really protected by an f3 connector, you could think of it like that. So more typically, if like your opponent is decent, they're going to go for knight h3, trying to chuck the knight into g5, which again, as I mentioned, is a very typical idea once we have committed to h5. You do not want to play your pawn to f6, by the way, uh, once you've already played h5, that's just way, way too weakening. So typically from here, you're going to see a lot of people either just playing c5 immediately or playing rook c8 and then playing c5 as a sort of preparation mechanism. In this position, I think it's fine personally to play c5 immediately. I think Magnus Carlsen had a game in this position, as we will soon see. But rook c8 is actually a bit more popular in this position among master players who seem to want to like that extra protection uh, with the c5 square, but I guess stronger engines more recently seem to see no problem with c5. But as I was just saying, Magnus actually did play a game. This was taken from Title Tuesday, which he actually lost, but had nothing really to do with the opening, but rather only a decision he made. His opponent played knight to g5, keeping the tension as we sort of discussed uh, a bit earlier. C takes d4 takes, and a lot of people would probably be inclined to play knight gf6, avoiding the trade of dark with bishops, However, it's fine to actually take, as our king is not really yet castled, but not in danger of running into any g4 stuff, trying to like open and sacrifice pawns in front of our king. And especially because we have this very timely queen b6 move, which tries to offer an exchange of queens, if which accepted gives us absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Generally, these Sicilian-like structures where the queens are off are pretty safe for us. And the sort of old school thought, furthermore, was that like not only is black like okay in these sorts of positions, but... Uh, the Sicilian endgames often benefit black actually because we have like an open C file to work with and uh, target weaknesses on, whereas white's D file isn't really as promising. So that's why Magnus's opponent, a 2600 grandmaster, played queen d2, avoiding the trade, rook c8, bringing the rook to the open file, knight e2. And notice how Magnus actually just doesn't really castle at all because again, th the moment you castle, you have to kind of worry about like g4 and like trying to like sacrifice all these pawns in front of the king. And I don't know if these are the exact engine moves, but I would assume this is something, especially in blitz, that he would want to avoid. So knight e5 instead, sort of threatening knight c4. Now the bishop is protecting that square. b4, bishop e2, a5, just gaining space. Rook e1, further gain space. Now after queen d4, now offering an exchange of queens. Things have changed a little bit and maybe a4 Magnus should have been a little bit careful because the issue now is if you just simply allow a queen exchange, this pawn is going to be a bit of a target. So Magnus tried to be a bit fancy and went queen c5 with the idea that after takes takes, now for rook d4 he gets like knight c6 and can defend this pawn while also gaining the tempo. But his opponent found a very nice response to this which was to play knight to d3 and then exchange this knight off such that now when rook d4 comes that's a lot more awkward to defend this pawn. Well actually his opponent did not play rook takes d3 but objectively that would have been best and c went for c takes d3 and still ended up going on to win the game. But again that was not because Magnus misplayed the opening it was because he made a mistake further down the line from what was otherwise a pretty decent position. And again just keeping in mind this particular idea with exchanging of the dark sword bishop which might appear counterintuitive but again because our king is in the center is not too big of a deal. So following on from what we were just talking about the h4 break, 
Another very common one is the G4 break, and I recommend just immediately going H5. But my sort of has a choice to go G5 or G takes H5. Again, H4 we just talked about this, right? Takes takes B4 is quite strong. But again, as I just mentioned, White does have the other choice between going G5 and G takes H5. I think G takes H5 is probably stronger in general, trying to keep the king side more open. Whereas G5 can sometimes be a strong idea, but in this exact one is not. I'll go into more detail why that is, comparing some examples soon of positions where g5 is good, whereas in this one it's not. But basically what you want to understand is that the position as a whole is quite closed right now. If the d5 was open, for example, and you play g5, this can sometimes be good. Again, I'll show a concrete example explaining why that is very soon. But in this case, it's not, so we can just keep the position closed, go e6. 97, let's say they play h4, 97, knight h3. And again, in the attempt to keep the position more closed, instead of going c5, what we're actually going to do is play a move that, again, looks a bit counterintuitive, d5. And this is strategically a very good position for us. Imagine they play e5, which you might think like closes in all our pieces. But when you think about like what it is that white can actually do, it's not obvious. They don't have a pawn break in the position because the king side's completely closed. Whereas black actually does, we have the c5 one, maybe not immediately, maybe even immediately actually, because if they take it, this pawn's very weak. But just with a very minimal amount of calculation, we can already see that this position, strategically speaking, favors black because we have a productive plan to pursue on the queen side, whereas white cannot say the same for the king side. To see a concrete example though of how this might unfold in practice, this is a 2300 fide rated play against a 2000 rated one. So we saw h5 in this game, g5, which I said is a strategic mistake. e6, 92. Uh, I think 97 is perfectly fine, but in this game, knight b6 was played. And the idea is if white is careless, then knight c4 is going to fork this and this. And again, as I've sort of alluded to in this video so far, the dark sword bishop is a very important white attacking piece. If they lose it, not good. So knight f4. Now, if we go this, they take it, and that's probably best avoided. So, knight f4, knight e7, queen f2, b4, kicking away the knight. And instead of going to e2 again, they, uh, which would result in them losing their bishop, has no more safe to go. They went to the slightly embarrassing b1 square. And again, going for the plan we just talked about, instead of going for c5, which would allow things to open up, we play d5. And again, if white plays e5, completely closing the center, that's not good. So white tried to keep things a little bit more complicated by keeping the tension in the center, going knight d3, I guess, hitting the pawn and also aiming for the c5 square. a5, knight c5, bishop c6. We castle kingside. We're not super worried about them attacking here. If the knights were lined up on g3, let's say, I can't really draw an arrow there, but g3 and f4, just imagine the knights like there, then they could sacrifice and like open up the king side, and that would be very bad but because they're all the way in the queen side, not really a big deal. a4, knight d7, we neutralize the knight. And if they just take us, that's really fine to be honest. We're going to continue ahead on the queen side of these pawn breaks, probably also bishop b5, exchanging off our bad bishop. But unfortunately, why let the game end rather quickly, not really paying attention to the like tactical aspects of position, f4, and after takes, takes d4, we trap the bishop and white is just losing. I also want to show an example game though where white took on h5, so here this happened, knight e2, they want to play knight g3, kick out knight away, and then probably play like h4, h5, e6 happens, knight g3, rook h8, we can also consider rook h4 in some situations, blocking the h pawn, if bishop g5, I think maybe we can play like bishop h6 for example. The idea being of course that if they take us, uh, we take this and then we are equal in material but I think positionally we are a little bit better because after let's say we develop the knight, go king e7, rook h8, we have a queer weakness to attack whereas white has no queer weaknesses of ours to attack because like if you think about it right, they have an isolated pawn and two pawn islands in total, this is one pawn island, this is another Whereas we have just one compact pawn island, which cannot easily be taken advantage of. But anyways, uh, rook h8 was played in this game, king b1, knight b6, with the sneaky idea that white didn't really notice, which was that now after h4, of course now taking, I think just bishop g5 is uh, a winning move, because like bishop h6, I mean, what does that really do, right? This doesn't come with a check, because the king is on b1. But of course, after b4, the problem is, is that when the knight moves, knight c4, well, there's an issue, and that's it. Like, we're forking these pieces. And as I've discussed many times, you, you don't want this. So, queen c1 takes, takes, and not only that, but we also win the h4 pawn. There's no bishop g5 motif. Now, 
and black just has better pieces and is also up a point. Well, I tried to get counterplay and the game went on, but like objectively speaking, this was not a good situation for the white pieces. And probably here, like, yeah, they need to maybe go queen f2, try and avoid that. But still, this is like a pretty decent position. We can play queen e7, long castles, and sort of safely castle over there, or relatively safely at least. We can also consider bishop h6 to try and trade off these bishops because, again, if our king isn't castling kingside, we don't really need that bishop to make our king feel safe, right? It just doesn't make sense for our king's castling over here. And since from a strategic point of view, this is kind of like their good bishop in many positions, again, it helps to exchange that one off. So I want to discuss something now, which to be honest, the majority of players who get to this position, both white and black, they're not going to understand, to be honest, most of, or they're not going to really know the nuances of what I'm discussing. So if this seems a little bit overwhelming, don't worry. It is for, to be honest, just most chess players. Like a lot of people blunder the sort of stuff I'm going to be talking about right now. For example, let's say white plays king b1. We talked about earlier how sometimes you want to prepare c5 with rook c8 and whatnot. And it might not be clear like when that's like important, when that's not. So I want to outline some of that right now. So let's say king b1 happens, right? This is an example of a position where if you go c5, it is in fact a mistake if you follow it up the natural way, which is instead of taking back the d-pawn, which is what the engine wants you to do now, and to be honest, isn't really as fun because you close the c-file, you don't activate a piece. Most people, like if they get to this position, they're going to play knight takes c5, but this is in fact like a mistake. And the reason is simply that after knight takes b5 here, well, I say simply, but a lot of people miss this, and so after a takes b5, you're not going to take back immediately because now knight e7 and black's fine. Uh, instead, you're going to take here first. And then, of course, if you take this, well, bishop takes b5 check, king of eight, and you're, you're just getting made. And this cannot be good. So from there, you could logically reason that, okay, it makes sense in this situation to play rook c8 and then prepare c5. And I, I would agree that that makes a lot of sense. However, let's say white plays a random move like h3 in this position. It's worth understanding why it works, well rather why c5 doesn't work after king b1 but it would in this position for example. And of course h3 doesn't really make much sense here, I just want to make like a random waiting move. But let's say after takes takes, white tries to win the same thing. Well in this position if we played a takes b5 right, bishop takes c5. Well here of course the same issue still occurs which is if we just take back we're losing. But the difference is the king on b1 is not protecting a2 so we can just take that and they can give a check, but it doesn't matter, we're going king f1. And again, while white is technically up material in this position for now, the threat of rook a1, which is going to be mate, is really annoying. Not to mention our bishop coming to b2 could also be a thing of the rook lined up there as well. So let's say they play c3 to be able to meet k1 check with king c2. Well, we can play queen a5, and this is starting to look incredibly ugly, where they have to deal with this bishop hanging. They, again, still have to deal with rook a1. Let's say they bring the bishop back to c4, for example. Well, at the very least, I imagine we could just go here, take, take, and then win the bishop there, and we're just simply up a piece. And if they, after rook takes a2, don't take on b5, let's say they just go c3 immediately, similar problem still like let's say bishop a3, they don't have a bishop hanging on b5 anymore, but still after rook a1 check, king c2, queen a4 check, either they move the king and lose the rook, or they go b3 and still lose the bishop, neither of these particularly great, which again brings us back to why king b1, we could not play c5 and we want to prepare a rook c8, whereas after most other moves we can probably play c5 immediately. There are also some other situations though where we need to be a little bit careful about how we plan the c5 break. For example, let's say we see h4, h5, let's just say some random move like knight e2. This doesn't really make that much sense in the position, but just to illustrate what I mean, if we played knight f6 here, this would probably be, like, first of all, c5 is what you typically want to do, but just for, uh, to illustrate a good example, if king b1 now, c5 is kind of difficult to play, because after takes, knight takes c5, there's a very annoying move white has, which is they can play e5. And now basically the issue is, is that because we developed our knight to f6 too early for knight on c5, we can't easily capture the pawn because then of course like they're going to exchange a bunch of pieces off and then at the end of that our knight on c5 is going to simply be hanging. And if we like move the knight away after e5, then we hang the d6 pawn and this also isn't good because we're just going to be a pawn down. But this is also relevant, let's say you play c5, immediately they take, they go king b1, well, if you're not aware of that sort of tactical idea, you're probably going to play knight of six here as well and then run into e5. So in this sort of situation, you'd also want to be wary of that and play rook c8 first. Maybe they play like knight d4 now, knight of six. And of course, in this position, you don't have to worry about any e5 stuff. You can 
happily go on with your life. Maybe you want to delay castling because again, that introduces bishop h6 ideas and also g4. So you might want to try and like still focus on hacking away on the queen side before again really trying to castle short and let white start throwing their stuff at us. And there is another situation, again, I don't want to make this some theory video where you're trying to memorize all these lines, but it is worth understanding why in certain position c5 is not so good again compared to other ones. So after g4 immediately, as you would have just saw, I suggested going for h5 immediately trying to clarify the situation on the king's side. Whereas if we go c5, d takes c5, knight takes c5, h4, this can be a little bit awkward to face because now if we go h5 as we typically like to meet h4 on the king's side, g5. If you remember against g4, h5, g5, I like to play e6, knight, e7 and try to keep things closed. But once we've already opened the center up, as we have in this position by playing c5 and this capture occurring, well, if we play e6 now, they just simply take and they're going to be a pawn up. We don't really want this. But the problem is, is that like in this position, right, where else do we develop our knight? Because like with the pawn on g5, we can't develop here. And if we try to play rook c8 and, I don't know, gain counterplay in the queen side quickly, well, the, the big issue now comes with bishop d4, which is that in many other lines, right, we could always just comfortably either take and then play knight of 6, or we could just block it all together with knight of 6 and, and not really worry about that. But in this position, because the pawn controls the f6 square, we don't have that option. So either we just play bishop takes d4 and then make some ugly move like rook h7, or we just try and play e5 and block this attack, but then after takes, either rook takes e5 and we hang this, or this, but then queen e3, and this is positionally not a very great situation. For example, bishop h3, rook e8, knight e2. If they want to try and castle, we'll give them a check, come back, and they just face a very difficult situation. Maybe f4 is going to be coming in conjunction with rook f1. Rook could also slide into d7. All in all, not many good things we can say about black's position, unfortunately. Some other aggressive setups, though, apart from the sort of 150 attack we just looked at, where white plays like bishop e3, queen d2, and then tries to go bishop h6, h4, and like blast us away on the king's side, it's also a very common setup for white to go on like f4, playing the style of the Austrian, where they just occupy a lot of space here, they try to play like e5, knight of 3, bishop d3, and like hack away. This can be an incredibly scary setup to face, and again, you could play the Pirates defense and transpose into that sort of stuff, but if you're here on this video and you've been watching this far, you probably want to play a6, so that's what we're going to play. And after knight of 3, we're going to go b5. And again, as I mentioned earlier, a3 being a very common mistake is actually what I had in over the board game last year when I played the modern against a younger kid who was right around like 1700 feet here, I think. And he made a very common mistake, which is that, you know, he occupied a lot of the center. He had a very scary looking pawn mass. But then what he proceeded to do was he played e takes d6. And this was the first red flag going off in my head where I'm like, why is he doing this, right? Like I just take back. And now, like, think about this. White has one thing going for them, and that's the fact that, like, these pawns can potentially do a lot of damage, like, maybe they can thrust it into e6, conjunction with knight g5, and, like, really go for a blitzkrieg attack. Not to mention, just, like, from a positional point of view, purely, this pawn just restricts out pieces greatly, right? But after e takes d6, it's like, all of that just goes away. We can take back. He even gave a check, but after knight e7, like, his idea was to, like, swap off all the pieces, but really what came of this position was like one where it was just a very, very good queenless middle game where my pieces are roaring on both diagonals for my bishops to be precise. My rooks can come to the center. I have a space advantage. They're behind development. They have like sort of weaknesses. There's basically just not a single good thing you can say about white's position. And it all started with this very typical mistake, which was trying to release the tension for like God knows what reason. And... I know the reason, and it was just simply that he got overwhelmed probably with all this like tension going on, like he's concerned that if I take this, then this is going to collapse, and so he quickly was like, oh, I'm just going to take, I'm going to bail out. But it's precisely this mindset, if our opponent has, that we are going to be looking very forward to, because when we simply recapture, right, like, who's to benefit? Well, it's clearly us, because they just got rid of their active pawn on e5, which was, again, restricting all of our pieces. We can bring our knight to e7 even if we want, and all that's left is really an overextended white center which leaves them with probably already a worse position on only move eight but even after let's say bishop d3 instead of a3 it's also very common after knight d7 let's say e5 the most principled move c5 for a lot of people just to like spaz out and take on d6 even though there's really not much good reason for this we can just simply 
take back and they'll already have a fine position. Knight e7, bishop e7, castles. If they go knight e4, we can just play the queen to b6 defended and continue developing with no problems. So that does beg the question then, what should white do in this position where like their center really feels like it's under a lot of pressure. And one of the better moves is for white to play, for example, bishop to e4, when black should move the rook to b8, of course, we don't want to hang that. And if white just castles continuing their development, I think the safest option for black is actually to play knight h6, just trying to complete our development, castle king side. There is also this line where you can take on d4, but after this, there's some exchange sacrifice you have to make and it's not to everyone's taste, so it is probably safest just going knight h6. For example, if like bishop e3, knight g4 is very pleasant. If they, let's say, also take on d6, there are some lines where they can play f5 and sort of get an initiative, so it's a little bit better just to sacrifice a pawn. Again, you don't really need to memorize all of this. The probability you're going to get this single position in any one of your games is quite low, but just understand the idea behind sacrifice and the pawn, which is that, like, it might seem scary to some people giving up material like this, but it's important to understand, essentially, we're just opening lines to, again, what is like a very overextended white position for the pawn on f4. They're a little bit behind in development. If we play knight f6 quickly, bring a knight to f5, or like bring the bishop to this diagonal, then our rooks to the center. We have a lot of activity to really show. But again, like all of this really stems from just like this position where you play c5. By the way, there, there are some move order nuances behind like going bishop b7 first or knight d7. I think it's considered a bit more accurate to go knight d7 first to get in c5 really quickly. But also like if castles, by the way, c5, it's generally considered more critical for white if they have this pawn mass to really use it as quickly as possible by going for the quick e5. If they castle c5, this usually gives black enough time to consolidate. Again, for example, like if they keep the tension in the center, we reach this sort of improved dragon structure we talked about earlier. And if c5, d5, again, we have a pretty good version of the Benoni since we have this established pawn mass on the queen side. So neither of these positions after c5 should be a particular source of concern. One last thing though I want to discuss in this sort of discussion of more aggressive approaches that white can have is when white launches a pawn forward again to e5, c5, and it goes for some sort of combination of like e6 and knight g5. For example, if they play e6 immediately, this is gonna look a little bit scary and we can safely take it, but after knight g5, how do we continue from here? For example, like if we just take on d4 of the pawn, knight takes e6, this is a very annoying fork, we're probably already losing. Taking on d4 of the bishop is mildly better with the idea that this time, at least we can give it up and uh, be up a pawn. But of course, with the knight on e6 and giving up our precious dark squared bishop, this is very double-edged and you want to be very careful <laughs> going into a position like this. Which is why the most common move from the Leech S database is actually for people to go Knight of Fate. And this not only defends the e6 pawn, but also defends the h7 one. For example, this becomes relevant after like takes takes, for example, where if Knight takes h7 occurs and Rook takes h7, Bishop takes g6, you can imagine if the Knight went to f6 instead of f8, then we wouldn't be able to just take this. Instead, like let's imagine the line, for example, the Knight goes to f6, takes, 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 well, then our queen simply hangs and we're losing the game. Whereas again, with knight f8, this time our knight is protecting the g6 pawn. That being said, however, in this exact position, knight f 6 does work. You just need to be willing to give back a pawn in this position, play knight h6 focus on your development, and now after takes takes, if you'd simply castle, play queen e7, develop your bishop, black probably has a reasonably fine position. As again, white is a little bit behind in their development because they spent a lot of time moving their pawns, playing e6, knight g5, and to be honest, at this point, doesn't really have a whole lot to show for all of that. Another approach is that if they go knight g5 immediately, seemingly neglecting their d4 pawn, in this position after e6, this can also get a little bit complicated, like for example, we just take the knight, well, they're gonna play e takes f7 check, knight e6 check, and this is definitely to be avoided when losing our queen of check. So you might think after e6 then, well, like, okay, our alternative is to take, but this also isn't very good, which you'd probably be correct in saying because after like queen a5, bishop d2, and let's say we take, take, king f7, bishop takes e3. I guess the easiest way to describe this is it's just not good. So again, after e6, you might think like we're basically like in big trouble then, but actually after this very precise move f5, which I'm not really going to recommend you to memorize all of this stuff. There is a simpler way to play this, I believe. It is just interesting to observe though that in this position, now their knight's hanging, so they want to move it e5. Black actually has pretty good compensation. We have this 
big central pawn mass and probably going to go e4 next if allowed. We are doing more than okay. But even more interesting is that white doesn't have to take immediately. They can also go knight to d5 and after knight c5, getting rid of the knight which is hanging on d7, knight of 7. This looks like a fork which might seem like it's quite troublesome because queen a5 is the only safe square but then b4 and it's like our queen is borderline trapped which means that we kind of have to give it up but then after takes takes strangely enough this position we're going to have two minor pieces and two pawns for the queen and overall just a very interesting imbalanced position however i think it is much simpler to avoid that and instead just go knight h6 with the idea that after e6 this pawn is defended and now if they try to like do any shenanigans on f7 we can just simply recapture this is no problem if they take on c5 we can probably take back but we can also maybe take on e6 just eliminating that bad guy and uh, again this sort of position is completely fine we have pretty active pieces white's will be behind development we do have these pawns which are maybe weaknesses but everything balances out and i would be happy to play his position as black. So that wraps up this section on the sort of aggressive subs white can play, but again, in particular, this last section, don't be overwhelmed with like this e5, knight g5, e6 stuff. There are some lines you can play, like if you're a complete crackhead and really love sacrificing your queen for, for God knows what reason, you can play some of the lines I showed, but it is also completely acceptable to just try and play things the safe way and gain your counterplay more gradually, again, with just like, more conservatively developing and playing in this fashion. So diving into the third part now, we're going to be covering more positional setups where white is going to go for more of a slow approach rather than as we just saw in the aggressive one where they try to like attack the king head on. This is going to be the one where white just says, okay, like I have a space advantage in the center. I don't need to do anything too drastic to really prove my position is better. So I'm just going to kind of take it easy, take it slow and eventually just win in a strategic manner and that's a very solid argument from the white perspective so let's really study how we should combat such situations as black and the first thing we're going to look at is let's say for example bishop e3 a6 we spent a lot of time looking at queen d2 long castles and they go for this very aggressive again like 150 sort of approach however what happens if they for example play a4 and stop us from going b5 this all of a sudden makes things kind of difficult for us because like, so far in this video, a lot of what we've been looking at has really revolved around us going like b5 and, you know, getting this very active counterplay on the queen side. But if they play a4, that really makes things all of a sudden a lot trickier for us. However, that also comes with the upside that a lot of these lines, right, where they castle queen side, they're no longer really going to have the option to go for because, I mean, playing with a pawn out like here on a4 and trying to do that with castling long just is kind of asking for trouble we're probably going to play b5 anyway open up the the queen side even if it means sacrificing the pawn and getting a lot of counterplay that's really way too risky for white to get involved in so usually if they do go for a move like a4 they're probably going to go for more of a king side castling approach if they do try to attack anyway on the king side they're probably going to have to keep their king in the middle of the board which is not really ideal so in this position then what do we really do and uh, to be honest i think given the fact that we don't really have to worry as much about like a lot of this king side attacking stuff i think that now it makes a lot of sense again to go back to sort of more of a perk setup with knight f6 except we have the moves a4 and a6 included which i again think benefits black because it, it makes a lot of these queen side castling ideas a lot less serious for example let's say white tries to go for queen d2 castles bishop h6 anyway i think black in this position can play e5 striking at the center and already one nice tactic is that if white plays d5 trying to keep the situation closed black you know probably could play c6 gaining counterplay against a d5 pawn but it's even stronger here to go knight takes e4 and the idea is is that after knight takes e4 queen h4 we're actually forking this and this and of course if you take we get this with check before we take back this so that just simply nets black an extra pawn let's say though they take and then they go d5 again trying to keep the center more close and then like go ahead on the king side and attack well here we just go c6 we chip away at the d5 pawn and i don't know if they go h4 for example at the very least we can just play h5 stop it and it's not very simple for them to actually proceed on the king side it's very stuck at the moment and strategically i actually think this is favorable for black this whole situation because the dark sword bishops again while sometimes that can potentially weaken our king side in this situation because it's not very easy for them to get at our king if we look at the central pawn situation where white's pawns are on light squares and ours are on dark squares 
we have in many ways traded off our kind of bad bishop, which means long term, as long as they don't really get to our king, which is kind of unlikely with the current situation, this exchange of bishops is actually probably going to benefit black. Also, let's say after king takes g7, maybe they're going to try and keep the tension in the center. We can also keep the tension of queen e7, long castles, and probably just something like bishop g4, for example, exerting some pressure on this diagonal, probably knight c6 next. Again, we can also consider something like b5, sacrificing the pawn at some point. This is not really white's ideal position. So probably instead after, for example, knight of six, perhaps a slightly more conservative approach given a four and more in line with the spirit of the position is say, let's say knight f3, castles, bishop e2. Just again, trying to say they're a bit better because they have this base advantage in the center. And what is black going to do? Well, that's for us to decide now. And I think, for example, one approach is to play b6 and say like, okay, we can't go b5 and uh, really gain all that space on the queen side, but we can still fianchetto our bishop to b7, attack e4, so let's try and do that, see where it goes, so bishop b7, let's say you defend it with knight to d2, by the way, if they go e5, I think we can go knight g4, and there's some interesting lines where perhaps they could go e6, with the idea that if f takes e6, knight g5, and there's an attack on this knight as well as the e6 pawn, this could be slightly uncomfortable to deal with, however, we can maybe place, for example, f5 to avoid that and this is a pretty unclear position where it is possible maybe white's going to try and squeeze us with d5 and shut in all our pieces we can always get counterplay of c6 but we have to keep those possibilities in mind but on the flip side this pawn could also just turn into a weakness if white is not careful but okay let's say after bishop b7 they play knight d2 one idea i like for black here is to play e6 and the point is if let's just say white plays f4 trying to storm ahead on the king side here i think black can play c5 and the point is, is that now, compared to doing this move before, right, where they could maybe play d5, and this is a little bit uncomfortable, now if we play e6, f4, c5, they don't really have that option because we can simply win a pawn. And if they can't advance it, well, they have to deal with the tension in the center somehow, maybe they just leave it, but then we're probably going to take, go knight c6. If they take, well, I think we just take back with the b-pawn, recapturing towards the center. So all of this is really nothing to be afraid of. Also, let's say maybe they go for bishop d3, trying to anticipate that we play b6, bishop b7 to attack the pawn. It's definitely still possible to go for this, but also another interesting approach is just go knight c6, and if castles, e5, strike in the center like so. And we're going to touch on this specific approach more soon, but just something to keep in mind. If d5, we can go knight e7, but you can also go, for example, knight b4, making use of the fact that when they've played a4, they can't kick the knight out so easily and trap it on the edge. Worst case scenario, we can always just play a5 at some point and tuck our knight back here and put it around to the c5 square. But otherwise, after e5, if they, for example, just take, well, we can always just simply recapture and have a fine position with an equal kind of space in the center. And if they keep the tension, well, we might just continue adding pressure to this diagonal with bishop g4, or if they prevent that, then maybe we can just take here and four bishop d7, rook e8, and perhaps eventually we're going to try taking, putting our bishop on this diagonal, and uh, I think black has a pretty decent position. However, on the complete contrary to the approach we just saw, where white, you know, tried to completely cock block black from playing b5 with a4. We're going to look at a subset of lines now where white actually lets black play b5, but then pretty much at a moment like this, they basically tell you, well, okay, it's cool you're doing this. I'm glad you're having fun, but it's time for that to end. I'm going to play a4. And we talked about earlier, right, how, like, for example, if unprompted, it wouldn't really make sense for us to play b4 because white can easily just regroup their pieces, chip away at the pawn eventually. However, when white plays a4, of course, and they directly attack the b5 pawn, now we, of course, need to do something about that. And, well, we don't really want to take, as discussed earlier, that's a positional sort of mistake. And we also just can't really keep the tension, so all that's left is to play b4, gain the tempo. And, of course, with the knight on c3, this is okay unlike the situations we described earlier where like i don't know if you have like a position such as this one where you just start going b5 and there's no knight here well after you get hit with a4 that's not really going to turn out uh very well for you this sort of position but okay what is the point of this whole line and basically it's that even with spending the tempo on a4 to force b4 out of black you can still go for this sort of approach where you, okay, c5 again is a very typical move in the spirit of the tiger modern, and white plays c3 to consolidate this pawn. And there's a few different things that you can kind of do here. You can, for example, exchange once and then keep the tension. You can exchange once here 
and do that. And you can also exchange twice and try and play like that. Or you could also just completely just keep the tension, not make any exchanges, wait for white to try and do that. But it's quite uncommon if your opponent actually knows this line that they're going to start making all of these exchanges for you. They're probably just going to play e5, castles, and probably go for some sort of knight g5 at some point, really trying to go for a brute force attack on the king side. And to be honest, out of all the different variations that white could play against modern, I think this is probably one of the most annoying ones. However, the good news again is that how many players are really going out there properly studying theory against modern? Not many. So how many players are going to play like this very annoying variation? Again, probably not many, it depends on your level a bit. If you're a titled player watching this video for some reason, well, yeah, it's gonna maybe be slightly more common. But that being said, one way of potentially approaching this position is to play a5, keeping the tension. In the past, when I've reached these sort of positions, a lot of the times I've liked to exchange once on c3, go a5 to prevent white from playing a5, and if castles, knight gf6, e5, knight d5. And my idea was always by exchanging one set of pawns that I would stop white from going c4 because like there's no c pawns there of course. And then try to like maybe play bishop a6 exchanging off their sort of good bishop or bishop b7 and try and like gain some playing the c file somehow. But again if white plays a critical knight to g5 this can be a little bit daunting to face. The best move here is to go f takes e5 F, sorry, D takes E5, F takes E5, castles E6. And then we get the situation after takes, 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 queen B6. Putting some pressure on this knight, also maybe this diagonal, perhaps even preparing bishop A6. And let's say if white plays a natural move like knight takes G7, apparently the top engine move is to play bishop C4, uh, just leaving this knight hanging. I suppose the idea is if we take this like knight of four or something, but a lot of people probably if they got to this position would just on the instinct play knight takes g7. I mean the knight was hanging, our bishop is also usually a piece you want to take. And I don't know, let's just say they try to attack our knight with bishop e4, but well, we can just defend at bishop b7. And I think next we can start consolidating our position and I don't really think there's a whole lot to complain about. But also let's say we just try and keep the tension completely with something like a5, this approach is also okay, but eventually we might take on d4 because it's difficult to really keep that situation forever. Uh, let's say queen b6, basically delaying going knight to f6 saying that okay if they go e5, well then we can probably just win a pawn uh, with the pin. So this is a little bit annoying queen b6 where we delay knight gf6 and let's say if they did now go bishop to e3, well now knight gf6 and e5 kind of runs into stuff like knight g4 for example hitting the bishop and of course they don't really want to lose this piece, it's a generally pretty good bishop for them if they retreat though they run into the issue that maybe again simply we're winning a pawn due to the pin on this diagonal. So if they maybe played something like h3 to stop knight g4, so let's say here we finally castle and let's say they go knight to g3. Now we can play bishop a6 and they can't really avoid the trade of bishops because of course if they did they would lose the rook. So you know as you typically want to do in these positions where you have a space disadvantage, it generally helps to exchange some minor pieces so that you don't feel completely suffocated. And then we can maybe look for at some point gain in a cheeky e5 break, maybe d5 as well as a consideration, or just try and place our pieces on the c file and hope for nirvana like that. However, it's worth noting, right, this is not the only variation in which can it occur, this Austrian sort of line. It can also occur in the 150, where, well, this isn't really a 150, the 150 more so refers to like windy 2 on castles and this kind of stuff. But we looked at this very early on in the video, right, and we considered like, okay, if Queen d2 for example, c5, we're kind of doing okay here, but a4 is slightly more annoying just chipping at the b5 pawn very actively and now if b4 and knight e2 again they go for this sort of setup where they have a very solid center. Only difference is they don't have a pawn on f4 so we don't have to worry about these e5 breaks as much and I think a position like this in general is quite solid, we might go bishop c6 next, rook fb8, and maybe white is just a tiny bit better here but it is not much and uh, especially considering that they haven't really done anything so wrong that's kind of logical because they have the white pieces, we've played a uh, hyper modern opening where we've given them a lot of space already in the opening. This is just how chess is sometimes unfortunately but Again, remember the number of people who will go for this sort of variation, it's a smaller minority, especially if like you're under 2000. So we briefly touched on earlier in the video, like, okay, if white plays, for example, something like this, right? Like you don't want to go a6 because there's just no knight here that you can attack and 
like I've said this multiple times now, but you just don't want to go this because why? Well, like yeah, a4 and this is going to get very ugly. Another point I should also note is that potentially black, sorry, white could rather go c4 and transpose into a king's Indian where our move a6 and how useful it is, is definitely a little bit questionable, which is why again, in this sort of position, you'd want to go knight of six. But for now, I want to look at this one bishop to d3, and again, I recommend going knight of six, not trying to do any of this a6 b5 crap when there's no knight on c3. Let's say the castle, castle. Many people call this a lazy variation for the reason why it's very often going to play like the same set of moves, c3, knight d2, rook e1, maybe maneuver the knight over to the king side, where they're not really trying to remember too much theory, they're just trying to get this kind of fairly solid setup and just play a game of chess, and I mean, fair enough, right? But what we're going to do against this sort of approach is, well, there's a few different things, but I quite like most is plan by going knight c6 and essentially aiming for the e5 break in the center. If they play d5 before like we even get that, I would recommend in this position going knight to b8, and this is going to hurt some people's ego because they're going to be like, oh, I don't really want to like come back to, to, to B8, right? Like this is just a waste of time. I shouldn't be doing this. But what you do need to take into consideration is they've just played D5, softening all of the dark squares on this diagonal, also the C5 square. So our knight can easily come back to, for example, somewhere like C5 and take residence there. But we can also, for example, play C6, gaining counterplay against this D5 point. Or maybe if they play C4 themselves, really solidifying down at this pawn, we can play e5 and make this more of a king's indian structure we will try to play like a5 knight c5 probably at some point like knight h5 f5 on the king side start storming over there and one thing to consider is that a lot of players with white if they only play one e4 they're not very good at playing these sort of king's indian positions and handling especially the king side attacks so even if you're not really a red blooded king's indian player these positions are still probably going to be a lot easier for you to play just because the ideas are like very natural compared to the white player who has no real experience defending against these sort of attacks. Also, I should note though after e5, they, they can go on passant, but we just take back and I don't really think this is a big deal. Knight c6 next, maybe bishop g4 if we get the possibility to pin them. I think this is quite decent. So after knight c6, probably we're most likely to see something like white just keeps a central situation. They play like h3, rook e1, knight d2. Let's just say h3 for now. We go for e5, which is our logical break. And here white has an option. Like many other situations we've seen with c5 break earlier in this video, it consists of white keeping the tension, just playing like, I don't know, rook e1 or something. They can push, go for d5, close the situation, or they can just take. And the after takes usually the way that you want to approach this, especially when there's a pawn on c3 restricting our knight, is to go knight takes e5, trying to exchange off the knight, which was again sort of restricted, and then after takes takes, getting this structure, where because we have an equal amount of space in the center, we're pretty safe, we can just develop our pieces like so, maybe knight h5, f4 at some point. If they also play something like, I don't know, d5, well, in some other positions we saw we could maybe go to b4, but that's not really possible here, so knight e7 is most logical, let's say they play c4, then we can just bring our knight back, either to d7 or e8, and after knight t3, go for f5, and we start storming ahead on the king side. Also, if they play knight g5 here, trying to go for knight e6, this can be slightly uh, concerning. However, here, I think just knight c5 covering this and also counter-attacking their bishop in center. I don't think there's a whole lot we really need to be concerned about in this position. So let's also look at what happens if they keep the tension, maybe something like bishop e3, for example. And here, a very typical plan I want you guys to remember is to basically start up a fire on the king's side and go for knight h5, queen f6, knight f4, and really use our pieces to make white feel very uncomfortable about the future of their king. However, we usually want to start this with h6 because just imagine, for example, like knight h5, knight d2. If we went queen f6 here, well, there's a clear issue, which is that bishop g5 is not going to trap our queen, but it's going to force it to go to e6, where it may as well be entrapped because now d5 forks this and this, and we're forked. So yeah, after this position, probably what I would recommend is start with h6, covering the g5 square. We can also maybe consider g5 at some point in the future, just being careful we're not weakening our knight squares too much. See the following natural moves. Queen f6, some people bring their knight around to f1, perhaps as an extra defender, maybe also to like bring it to g3 or h2 and g4 maybe, but okay, we go knight f4 and we have a pretty straightforward plan from here on out. We're going to play g5, maybe h5, g4, 
perhaps with our queen on g6, maybe even bring the knight along to that square. And while the engine does think white is a little bit better, in practice it can be very difficult for white to really defend against this sort of attack. And again, a lot of people are going to spaz out and maybe they're going to like, I don't know, take on f4, but after queen takes f4, they just gave up a very good bishop again. And this ultimately just leaves us, of course, with a strategic advantage. And again, if they continue like spazzing out for no reason in center, going d takes e5, well, I, I don't believe, you know, letting our pieces get very active like this with the bishop here is a particularly great idea. Yeah, this is eventually probably going to backfire on them. Well, actually, in this circumstance, queen g5, I think, because otherwise this might actually get our bishop trapped here. So if queen g5, though, uh, of course, then we can just take it and this is hanging if they go king to h2. Maybe now we can just uh, slide the bishop back and uh, this is very unlikely this will happen that they'll make all these like terrible exchanges. It could happen, I, I, I don't know, but yeah, in general, the basic gist is from this sort of position, right, if they just keep the tension indefinitely, well, in, at this point, you should start looking into trying to fire something up on the king side. You can also, in some situations, consider a move like d5, trying to liquidate the center and try to equalize more directly. This is slightly more dry, but the engine likes this approach a little bit more actually when it's possible because you immediately resolve all the tension in the center, you get rid of your space disadvantage, but from a practical point of view, it's not really as fun if everything just kind of liquidates. But for example, like if, if D takes E5, Knight takes E4, if E takes D5, you can play Knight takes D5 and now like the bishops open this down, you're also hitting the bishop on g5 and they play well sorry on e3 but it can come to g5 like this and if they exchange a bunch of stuff off like that uh we're not really too concerned this is again pretty equal and maybe our pieces are even slightly more active we're also gaining a tempo on this bishop so yeah just keep this plan in mind you know when you face a more kind of slow variation like bishop d3 where they don't commit a knight c3 also let's say bishop e2 knight of six where in say this sort of variation we are sort of forcing the knight c3 i mean it could go to d2 but it's a bit Kind of out of place with the bishop on e2 it's typically if it's in more of a bishop coming to d3 but okay let's say they do play knight c3 we can definitely now consider with the knight being here that we can go a6 b5 perhaps but also we can just castle and again a6 is a possibility but i also quite like the idea of knight c6 try and prepare e5 in the center and if they go d5 again knight b8 we can chip away this d5 pawn with c6 for example as to say the following moves happen i don't know they play like some a3 crap we take go a6 maybe trying to prepare b5 and i don't know if they allow that then we go bishop b7 knight d7 maybe try and even attack the pawn with knight b6 and if they play a4 to prevent that then maybe we can just go knight b7 b6 bishop b7 and it's slightly passive this position but ultimately still a very complicated position plenty of pieces on the board this is ultimately what we want as a modern player and for the last part of this section we are again going to be looking at like this position with a4 and you might be thinking sam we just looked at this earlier like you can just go knight a6 castles and then maybe go like knight c6 6 e5 afterwards but in this exact position where white has already committed both their knights to f3 and c3 when they go for this move a4 and again maybe some other positional setups as well but especially in this position is where when we go for this sub starting with b6 bishop c4 e6 97 and this is what we'd call like generally the hippo setup where we have our pawns set up like this our knights on e7 d7 now bishops on b7 g7 is a kid i thought this opening was just sort of a meme it wasn't really serious eventually later on i read this book called the, the modern tiger which again i put up on the screen here written by sort of the founding father of the tiger modern i realized that this is actually a very difficult kind of setup to play against and the reason is is that white pawn breaks are always going to be met by a counter break from black for example if white tries to go a5 we're going to go b5 and if they go d5, we're going to go e5. If they go e5, we're going to go d5. And, well, maybe in some cases we can even just win a pawn in the center. It depends on the exact circumstances. And to just sort of show how things can play out a little bit, let's say white plays queen to d2, knight d7, rook e1, bishop e7. They bring all their pieces to the center. They're doing the, the normal kind of crap you expect one to do. Also, just want to note earlier after bishop e3, it's important here that we don't castle. I see a lot of people do this, but this is a mistake when you enter the hippo, which is not just castling in general, but more so this specific situation where once they've played bishop e3, they're ready to go queen d2. And once they get in this, they stop h6 essentially, and they can also then plant the bishop here. And that's a very annoying exchange 
for them to make. So we want to make sure we're first playing h6. And now if they go rook e1, for example, now we can safely castle because queen d2, we go king h7. Or maybe even g5 is also potentially fine. But of course, the moment we go h6, they're also down to go queen d2. So now we cannot castle because the pawn hangs. So that means very often one of two things is going to happen. Either we keep our king in the center and maybe, for example, it's not unheard of in the hippo to go to f8, to g8, and then to h7 all the way to protect this pawn, or we just say like, fuck it and go g5, knight g6, and try and go like g4, h5, and hack away on the king side. That is also something that you sometimes see. For example, uh, let's say rookie one, rook d1, g5, and like, let's just say white wastes a few moves, like they just move back and forth with the bishop like this. I hope no one actually plays chess like this sincerely, but in this position, right, like g4 uh, would, actually just trap the bishop, sorry, the knight rather, because like, it can't go to any of these squares, none of these squares are available, so therefore, well, it's trapped. And yeah, white has to be very careful of that because it's very unusual, right, that like you just have this sort of setup where you go g4 and kind of seem like you're breaking all the rules in the opening, but somehow also like just winning big time it doesn't really make sense. But that's also one of the big appeals of the hip hop, I guess, which is a, it's sort of like Mihal Tal's quote, right, where you want to take your opponent into a, a deep, dark forest where 2 plus 2 equals 5. That's kind of in many ways like what the hippo is. We're like white, they feel like they should have good position, they have developed all their pieces, they have the center. But at the same time, it's just not clear like where do they go from here. Because again, all the pawn breaks, it's like a5, they, we get b5, e5, we can go d5, or we can maybe even like take, take, and then win a pawn, right? That's something they have to be quite careful of. Finally, of course, d5. This is one the engine likes most, but after e5, of course, we keep the center closed and we continue on with our like, king side shenanigans. So when I say d5, because like, again, I just said this was the best one, e5, b4, trying to advance on the queen side, this makes sense, knight to g6. Also, bear in mind, if you go f5, this might look very natural, but you are weakening a lot of the dark squares, sorry, the light squares. So I would be careful about playing this once you've already played g5, but let's say knight g6 instead, h3, and here I quite like knight to f4, when perhaps we could also consider something like h5, g4 coming up and uh, really storming ahead on the king side, creating some dangerous attack. Again, a lot of people might just sort of like go crazy and take on f4, but then we're not really going to complain. This is quite our liking opening the g file. We can reroute the bishop around potentially this diagonal. Maybe the knight's going to come to f6 and try and involve itself, like maybe via h7, g5. And to be honest, we can probably just leave our king in the center, like put on one of these squares, e7 or d7. Because I mean, like how are they realistically going to open the center? Not really clear, right? So yeah, that's a hippo. It looks very appealing, but keep in mind, right? Like this works best when these knights are already committed to f3 and c3 because like, I don't know, let's say knight c3 happens and you want to go like b6 and you want to go for the hippo immediately. Well, the reason this isn't very good is let's say we have a position like the following, right? Well, the problem is like when white gets three pawns in the center and this can either be like in this sort of position or this one, they typically have the pawn break that was so difficult to obtain in like these other positions we were looking at, such as this one, right? Where like, if you just imagine, for example, like we had a pawn on g6 and they had a pawn on f4, well, all of a sudden, right, they have like this f5 break, maybe it's gonna be a pawn sacrifice in some lines, but at the very least they do have that idea, right, to really create some fire in the center. But purely because these knights were holding back the pawns from advancing, right, they have not gotten that, and because of that, their position is very difficult to play. But if you go for, like, a hippo against the Austrian in these sort of circumstances, well, you're probably going to live a very unfortunate life, because, like, let's say in this position, e6, well, I imagine Weiss is really going to quickly go f5, blast apart the king side. Like, if you take this twice, for example, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you that we're probably, like, in severe severe danger because like just castles for example there's rookie one that's sort of a threat there's also knight g5 queen h5 just bringing all their pieces over it, it, it's not good so i mean black would probably try and keep things together somehow maybe like go take take and sorry not that like 97 but still like even if they just went take take and like knight g5 i don't even know if this is a top engine move but it wouldn't surprise me if this was good because like, I mean, look at all the, the danger 
encroaching on the f7 point if they go d5 maybe even like queen f3 i don't know this is just looking very very dangerous once again so the hippo remember it can be a very fun opening to play it can be perhaps humiliating for your opponents if they just reach a position like this and then spend like half an hour thinking about like what to do and then they play like a terrible move anyway and you just hack away on the king side but in circumstances uh such as these ones right where like they have three pawns in the center like they do with the austrian like chill out a little bit don't go for this otherwise you're probably going to lose a pretty bad game so to finish up we're going to be tying up some loose and some miscellaneous stuff of the modern opening and i think one of the first important things to get out of the way is probably going to be one of these uh subs of bishop c4 and this sort of can maybe be described as one of these more positional subs to a white does not commit a knight to c3 again i mean a6 you could technically play it in this situation it makes slightly more sense because at least when we play b5 we're going to be heating this with tempo but still in this position i prefer to go for other approaches such as knight of six when we either going to be seeing one of two ways that white defends the center either with something like knight to c3 or maybe queen to e2 i think queen e2 is a little bit better i think if you play this line uh specifically with this move order knight of three d6 bishop c4 by the way fun fact if you go knight d7 don't do this because now bishop takes f7 and you're losing because after takes knight to g5 check king comes back to any of these squares 96 traps the queen uh and if you like go king of six well then that's mate in one so don't do knight d7 and uh, bishop c4 uh yeah knight of six is probably again the i think best move queen e2 though i think is yeah like probably white's best continuation and there's a few different ways this could unfold you could for example go for like the knight c6 plan we've been talking about and then go for like a very quick e5 it's also possible though to just castle castle and allow white to go like god say after bishop g4 e5 and this is an interesting position if they go rook d1 i think you can always go c6 and it's not really it's a little bit awkward but it's nothing too uncomfortable but after knight of six what a lot of people will do is they will play especially in all levels move knight c3 and after castles castles i think knight takes e4 is a uh, quite an annoying move for white to face where well, we decimate their center and of course if they take it then we go d5 so we win back a piece uh and if they take it giving up the bishop here this is definitely not a problem let's say like we bring the bishop to g4 and like i don't know knight c6 e5 at some point no problem and if they are uh, save the bishop and go bishop d3 this is also not really an issue we can play knight d7 i think if you play knight c6 the knight might end up sort of restricted here unless we go for a quick e5 but we always have to watch out for d5 bishop g5 sort of idea so i think knight e7 is a bit simpler and if they say go for c3 i quite like the idea of going c5 for this break queen c7 and then exchanging and going for a6 when we will prepare something like knight to f6 after which the bishop might go off this diagonal and then we can play b5 bishop b7 rook d8 or if they keep on this diagonal we can maybe consider something like e5 e4 and then like rook d8 and you get the picture right i think it's quite a playable position for black and also after knight takes e4 if they instead maybe go bishop takes f7 check bailing out before they take back well i think here you want to prevent a knight coming to g5 so i think h6 is a strong idea if they if they play c3 i think bishop g4 and this pin is incredibly annoying so probably they should prevent that but then after queen f8 right it's actually a very uncomfortable position where like it's not really clear how they can even prevent us from just taking and with this small cheapo and kind of winning a pawn because the knight is then going to be hanging if they take back so yeah difficult situation that white is faced with and is why you should never really be concerned about someone playing in this sort of in this very primitive way i guess you could say where like you know they develop their knights to the center they put a bishop on c4 it's sort of like the stuff that a lot of young kids play growing up when they get into chess because it looks very natural that you want to attack their king but unfortunately against a modern setup it just doesn't really work because of this knight fork trick among some players as well it is sometimes seen that they don't even go d4 they sometimes for example some people might go for like this sort of stuff that we were talking about with bishop c4 and but again like it, it's not really that scary they might even play d3 not even going for like d4 but i think in this sort of circumstance you can just go like c5 knight c6 maybe a6 b5 from out not scary but there's also a subset of players who go like knight c3 and the idea is to go f4 and the idea is that eventually probably for black the most principled move is to go c5 and i recommend this but 
basically what they're doing is if they play knight c3 against the modern, they probably also play knight c3 against Sicilian, and they're basically hoping for some sort of transposition to what we'd call the Grand Prix attack. But fortunately for us, I don't think this is too intimidating because let's say we get the following position, there are two main sort of approaches that white has. The old approach is to go bishop c4, but I think when black has not yet spent a tempo on d6, this is quite good for us because we can play e6 castles, knight g7, d3, and then d5 in one go. Or after casting in queen e1, d5, and basically blunt the bishop on this diagonal and make it so a lot of their attacking ideas, white wants to eventually go queen h4, f5, sacrifice a pawn, and really get aggressive on the king side. A lot of this stuff isn't really working so well. For example, with bishop to b3, the most popular move is to go knight d4. This is definitely possible. And after like, for example, takes, takes, knight e2, there's some line like you go b5 and you now develop the bishop on this diagonal. Definitely possible. I kind of like this idea as well of going knight to a5, just trying to eliminate the bishop but without letting them potentially exchange our knight off. And for example, if they go queen to h4, knight e to c6, uh, just simply trying to exchange queens and say that if they do exchange queens, which a lot of people do, by the way, if they play like, I don't know, knight g5, I mean, it's not really going to go anywhere. So like if they go queen takes d8 though, Rook takes d8. Basically our argument is, is that with the queens exchanged, right, like what, what's all this king side stuff? It's not really going to go anywhere now. And if they try to take on d5, which again, a lot of people unfortunately do, we will take on b3 and then take back on d5. They are not going to be winning a pawn here. And now pretty much what remains is us having a positional advantage due to our bishop pair. Their overextended pawn and f4, maybe knight b4 is going to be a threat. And all in all, it's a very comfortable position, nothing to complain about. And uh, that, I guess, also leaves us so with the, you know, thing that they don't have to play bishop c4, they could also go bishop to b5. And this you need to be a little bit careful with, because if you, for example, play like e6 and try to go for the same stuff, well, they're probably going to take, before you do that, double your pawns. You could also take back this way, but either way, I, I don't particularly like. And especially here, they might get like a quick e5, knight e4. Not 100% on that, but in general, that's like the positional idea of bishop b5 to exchange the knight off, give well, exchange a bishop off for the knight and then give black these uncomfortable double c pawns, really cripple their activity on the queen side, and then go for the same sort of Grand Prix hack away over there. But luckily for us, we don't have to comply. We can play knight d4, avoid that trade. If white takes this and we can simply recapture, and this order position is fairly all right, if I do say so myself, we can probably go b5. And uh, this is a bit of a pickle they've gotten themselves into here with their bishop. If they just castle knight f6, they're going to have to either uh, move the bishop and lose a pawn, or they just let us take and give them an awkward d5 pawn there. So, probably instead of castling, they should go d3, but then we can go e6, bishop b3, knight e7, knight c6 castles, and I think we're pretty much okay. It's a bit more common after knight d4 to see people go for something, let's say, like just castling, letting black take it, and you can take it, but you can also maybe go a6, and for example, there's some line that goes like the following if we take back knight f6, if they by the way, take, I think you can just go queen to b6 because now if c3, e5 just wins material and if white does go c3 immediately attacking the pawn, then we can just take it and either way they take back, we can probably just castle next, play b5, bishop b7 and I think we have a pretty comfortable existence. It's also worth noting in this position that white can play c4 and a lot of this video is not really centered around this and the reason is, is that most e4 players are not going to play like this because one... Well, the, the main big point is just simply inviting the King's Indian transposition. And, uh, like, the King's Indian is not an opening, <laughs> again, that most 1e4 players are really going to feel comfortable in. So it doesn't really make sense for them to voluntarily play like this. And I have a video on the King's Indian. It's, like, 22 ideas. I could be getting that wrong. It might just be 20 ideas every King's Indian player must know. And uh, if you want to learn the King's Indian, I would suggest checking that video out. I'll put it somewhere up in the cards. But if you also are kind of lazy and you can't really be effed learning the, the King's Indian because you play something else versus 1d4, you just hate the idea of playing the King's Indian, well, you're in luck because there are some tricky sidelines you can play here that do not involve just transposing to the dreaded King's Indian. One of which involves playing 
knight c6 immediately attacking the d4 pawn and if they defend that off knight f3 bishop g4 it's already getting a little bit annoying if they ever push d5 knight e5 is possible also knight d4 is also an idea let's say though after bishop g4 they play bishop e3 now we can go e5 d5 now we can pounce into d4 I think this makes most sense for the bishop on this diagonal if it wasn't here then we could of course go back to e7 though e2 we take it, bishop takes f3, knight e7, and for example, we can go c5 here. And this is just in general a very annoying piece for them to deal with. They can take, and I think taking back the, the b pawn makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, in general, this is a pretty nice position for us to have. They can also maybe play bishop e3 immediately, avoiding this pin. I think we can still probably go for e5 though, d5. In this circumstance, knight d4, knight e2 can be a little bit tricky because now I mean if we just give up the knight it's not really much fun if we go bishop g4 there is this kind of wacky line that you can play which involves playing bishop takes f3 takes and like giving up uh the piece for two pawns and trying to attack the king but it definitely is not quite sound according to ancient standards and you'd probably want to only reserve this for something like blitz otherwise I think it's quite decent to go for let's say knight e7 and the point is here like, I don't know, let's say they play bishop d3, for example, we can go f5, and we have a pretty decent version of the king's Indian with a very quick f5 in. So this is definitely something we should feel quite at home in. And also if knight to c6, d5, let's say, well, we can just go knight e5. And if they try pushing us around a lot, I think it's not too much of a worry. Let's say we can play e5, counterattack their center. If they go on person, I, I don't think this is uh, anything too much to be worried about. We can just, like continue developing maybe go e5 again in the near future and if they try to keep the tension with let's say bishop d3 we can take carve out some weak dark squares in the center play knight gf6 and among like say knight g4 to e5 and also knight h5 just attacking the bishop with tempo and opening the bishop up this is a pretty decent position for black all things being considered it's also worth noting though in this position that white doesn't have to go knight c3 they can also go knight f6 sorry knight f3 rather and in this position i think we can go bishop g4 immediately and then like go for similar ideas so yeah just keep that in mind when you see if you do ever see this on the board i didn't see it a whole lot when i've played the modern in my time but there may be some people out there who do this or like if you want to play g6 against one d4 and like you, you land yourself in this position right this could also happen but you have to also learn some lines against knight f3 knight c3 where like for example it's not going to be so easy in this position to like go bishop g4 because there's not really like well like let's say e3 for example because the pawn is not on e4 it's a lot more difficult to play knight c6 and pressure like the center in the same way we did in the other variations so just keep that in mind if you are going to play g6 against d4 it's definitely possible but you have to modify certain things and certain variations but finally uh i do want to just end the video off by saying that if you do want to play g6 against like more than just one e4 one of the big appeals actually is is that london players are going to cry when you play g6 bishop f4 and you play the following setup where like, it's definitely possible to play knight of six here, but I think, sorry, not bishop f6, that's a bit of a bizarre move, but knight of six here, like, that's very standard, and, like, this would transpose to, like, very normal stuff that you might see in this position, right, where, like, okay, this happens, and white plays, like, whatever they play, right, but I think it is incredibly annoying for London players if we go for this move order and we don't commit our knight to f6 early on, we go knight d7, and now what we're going to do is we're going to go for a very quick e5, blunt the bishop really badly, let's say c3, e5, they go back, a lot of people also will take, uh, but this is actually quite nice, where they trade off their d4 pawn, we now have a space advantage in the center, let's say they go bishop g3 though, and here the typical idea is to go to h6, again we don't want to go to f6 now because we would hang the pawn like that, so knight to h6 is a fairly logical way of doing things, let's say knight b to d2, we're going to play knight to f5, they attack our knight now we don't really want to allow that so i think taking and winning the bishop pair makes a lot of sense and in general we just have a nice sort of slight advantage in this position with some space in the center in the bishop pair potentially also going f5 in the near future also though if after knight h6 let's say they go bishop d3 stopping knight f5 then we can just go castles castles f5 and we are running an e4 fork 
maybe the knife can come around this way if needed, but yeah, not a whole lot to really complain about here, to be honest. And I also just want to say that in addition to this being a very easy counter against just the plain old London system where they put their pawns like this, it's also quite good against Jabal and London players who might want to play knight c3, d6, and if they go e4, it's like tiger modern territory. But if they go queen d2, let's say we go a6 anyway, long castles, b5, well, at some point, like... If they really want to make the most of their position, they're probably going to have to play e4. But this is very much resemblant of the 150 attack positions we saw earlier in the video, except for the fact the bishop is on f4 instead of e3. And I think that's just for the worst, honestly, because it just means that the bishop is on this diagonal hitting basically granite. On e3, it at least protected the center, and many variations we remember, right, where like a knight would be on d7, they would take, take, and they'd come with the bishop to d4, and like stuff would happen. On f4, it doesn't really get any of that, and this is just not a very amazing position for them. For example, bishop b7, f3, knight d7, h5, let's say knight h3. All the same moves, except like now, c5, for example, and immediately because, again, the bishop is here, not here, they have to immediately deal with the pressure in the center a lot more quickly, and it's not a very fun situation to be in, to be honest. So yeah, basically, g6, it can potentially be used against many more openings than just one e4, could potentially be a universal opening as black. But on that note, we're going to end off the video at this point. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you liked it, I mean, please leave a like or subscribe down below if you are not already. But that being said, I don't have anything more to say. Hope you guys have a good day.